looking forward to a great couple of days. And without further ado, I will uh, hand it over to Christoph uh, Frommer uh, from uh, AIP Potsdam for our first uh, overview talk on uh, multi-phase gas uh, around galaxies with cosmic rays and uh, magnetic fields. Please, Christoph. Thank you very much. Can everybody organize us for pulling this up? I mean, I am really excited to participate here and to listen in to all the talks that are coming. So today I would like to talk about the multi-phase gas and in particular on the role of cosmic rays, magnetic fields, and cooling processes. And of course, we all know this galaxy, <coughs> M51, which is basically the poster child starburst galaxy where we can directly observe the multi-phase nature of the outflows of galaxies. And of course, number one question, how on earth do you make such a galaxy? Now, the kinematic signatures of M82, um, of the wind in M82, is consistent with a hot outflow bounded by a cone of atomic and molecular gas. So the hot gas, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7K ionized gas, is traced by X-rays. The warm, 10 to the 4K atomic gas, is traced by H1 and H-alpha. And the cold, 10 to 20K molecular gas, is traced by carbon-oxygen. <clears throat> now, the question I would like to answer, not, not finally answer, but give some sort of clues about how can we then accelerate a warm cloud by a hot wind that we observe here. Now there's three possibilities I can think of. There's the wind ramp pressure aided by magnetic tension that acts on a cloud. The second possibility is a cosmic ray pressure gradient that applies work on a cloud. And finally, there could be thermal instability of a hot wind that cools and thereby transfers momentum to the cold phase. All right, let's get started and look at the overall composition of the CGM. So a tool for this that we and many others have been using quite a bit are cosmological galaxy formation simulations, starting at some early time and then turning the crank all the way to today. So we have been using the Auriga galaxy formation model. Uh, that particular uh, suite of cosmological simulations was led by Rob Grant and Rudiger Packmore. And we have been using two of those simulations in a paper led by Tobias Book and run these two galaxies with four cosmic ray models each. So that's now the images of the stellar population of these four models. On the left-hand side, that's the traditional Auriga model, no cosmic rays. And then from the right to the left, that's a model where we additionally account for the advection of cosmic rays. Then the second one is where we additionally to the advection account for diffusion. And finally, where we additionally account for alphane wave losses. And what you should take away there, the galaxies look different. They look quite different. Why is this? Well, depending on how you transport cosmic rays, the cosmic rays can go into the CGM and they can dominate the thermal uh, thermal dominate over the thermal pressure like what you can see here. So what is shown here is the cosmic ray to thermal pressure ratio, and red means that it's totally dominated by cosmic rays. So the diffusion model, the cosmic rays dominate out to scales of 60, 70 kiloparsecs. And that's different to the advection model or the model where we additionally count for alpha wave losses. What does it mean? Well, if you hold up this, um, this hydrostatic atmosphere by cosmic rays, then of course the gas can cool down to lower temperatures. And that's what you can see in the bottom panels. This is a temperature distribution in these four models and they look different. Not only the temperature looks different, but also the gas density. It's more smoother in the diffusion model while it's very structured in the classical or the traditional Auriga model without cosmic rays. And in a model with additional alpha wave losses, it's somewhere in between. So what you should take away from this is, it really matters how you transport to cosmic rays to what you get out there in the CGM. So this brings me to the first topic, cosmic ray transport. That's an extreme multi-scale problem. So we want to understand and to simulate a Milky Way-like galaxy, say on scales of tens of kiloparsecs but we need to account for the gyro orbit of GV cosmic rays, which is a quarter of an AU. So the scale separation is 10 to the 10 in linear scale. And that's of course impossible to solve directly. Therefore, we need to develop a fluid theory for a collisionless non-Maxwellian power law component. 
what's the physics we need to understand? Well, let's look in detail. Cosmic rays that um, encounter magnetic fields, a homogeneous magnetic field, they gyrate around this magnetic field. All of us know this. What if this cosmic ray encounters then an alpha wave? An alpha wave is a transverse perturbation to the magnetic field shown in blue. Well, if that wavelength is equal to the gyro radius of cosmic rays, something interesting happens. And that's what you can work out yourself. So the cosmic rays first goes into the board. So the V cross B force, the Lorentz force, is decelerating the cosmic ray in the first quarter of the orbit. The second half, well, the cosmic rays comes out of the board, so the V cross B force is also decelerating. And so does it during the last quarter of the orbit. So only if we have the gyro resonant interaction does the alpha N wave decelerate the cosmic rays along its entire wavelength. Now, alpha N waves are not single perturbations, they come in wave trains. And as we all know, an alpha N wave is a transverse perturbation. There is no electric field in the frame of this alpha N wave. Therefore, these, this alpha N wave cannot do any work on the cosmic rays. So if you decelerate the parallel momentum, you have to increase the perpendicular momentum, and therefore you change the pitch angle. That's the angle between the momentum vector of the cosmic rays and this magnetic field vector. So what we learned so far is cosmic rays scatter on magnetic fields and isotropize their momenta. Now in the 60s, Carlsberg and Pierce found the streaming instability. If the cosmic rays move faster than the alpha in wave speed, the cosmic ray flux excites and amplifies an alpha N wave field in resonance with the gyro radii of cosmic rays. Scattering off of this wave field limits the GeV cosmic ray's bulk speed to something of order the alpha N speed. The alpha N waves are damped, and this effectively transfers cosmic ray energy and momentum to the thermal gas. That means this extremely um, dilute populations of cosmic rays, where you have one part in one billion particles being a cosmic ray in the ISM, exert a pressure on the thermal gas, not by colliding with the thermal gas, but via scattering on the alpha waves. If there's a weak wave damping, there's a strong coupling because the amplitude of the wave remains almost there, and therefore the waves scatter the cosmic rays into their frames, causing them, the cosmic rays, to stream along with the waves. If the waves are strongly damped, there are less waves to scatter the cosmic rays, and cosmic ray diffusion prevails. So, Timon, uh, before I go there, let me sort of summarize what are the different modes of cosmic ray propagation. First of all, magnetic fields are flux frozen into the plasma. If you move the plasma, you move the cosmic rays with vect cosmic rays. Second, if you have a source of cosmic rays here, and if diffusion prevails, then, of course, you get a classic solution where the typical length scale over which cosmic rays diffuse depends on the diffusion coefficient. And finally, if you have a strong coupling of cosmic rays to the thermal plasma, you get a streaming solution. And you get a typical length scale that is the alpha speed times the time you're looking at this. Now, Timon worked out the physics of this starting from the quasi-linear theory of cosmic ray transport and derived four equations. An equation for the cosmic ray energy, a second equation for the cosmic ray flux density, and two for the alpha, in, alpha in wave energy densities of the waves propagating to the right and those propagating to the left. Now let's look at the movie. What happens to such an initial condition? Well, the cosmic rays stream to the left and to the right. This causes a cosmic ray flux. This flux drives the alpha waves unstable. Those scatter again the cosmic rays into their frame, modulating the speed at which cosmic rays are being transported. I told you it's very important now to look at the damping. That's what we have done here. So these are the, it's the same initial problem. And the only thing we did change is the damping process, the amount of damping. The red curve is a model where we have a strong damping, that means you damp the waves. If there are less waves, they cannot scatter the cosmic rays efficiently into their frame, and therefore the cosmic ray flux is higher. And if the flux is higher, they move faster, 
that it fuses more compared to the alphine speed that basically tell you how fast are the alphine waves moving. Now, if the damping is less strong, this is the blue curve, the waves are still sufficiently um, powerful to scatter cosmic rays into the frame, the flux is smaller, and they stream. That's great. So this allows us now to solve for how cosmic rays are being transported self-consistently in the self-confinement picture. So if you look at the math, and I've provided the equations in the appendix to this talk, so I don't bore you with those, you can see that there's a moment expansion very similar to radiation hydrodynamics. So the only two differences that we have a charged relativistic a radiation hydrodynamics, and second, we have to account for the Lorentz forces that the photons don't feel. We account for kinetic physics, nonlinear Lando damping, gyrus instability, and that's now a classic test. So this is now cosmic rays in the Arepo code in this new model, where we have a ring magnetic field. And if I plot this movie, you can see the cosmic rays are not moving perpendicular to the magnetic field, but along the magnetic field with a speed that is similar to the alphine wave shown here in white. This model is Galilean invariant and causal and conserves energy and momentum, at least in the Newtonian approximation. Now, <clears throat> we are coming now to sort of the number one problem, how can cosmic rays accelerate a dense cloud? That's what we've been simulating here. In fact, Timon has been simulating this. This is a dense cloud that is denser by a factor of 100 compared to the background that is sitting in pressure equilibrium there. We are now basically looking at a flux of cosmic rays that comes from the left-hand side, from here, and we would like to understand what happens. And to do so, let's consider what is the alphine speed here. We have a constant magnetic field. The density increases, means the alphine speed drops inside these clouds. That means, if you're suddenly on your motorway and you find particles or cars in front of you that move 100 times, or in this sense, 10 times slower, that means you have to brake. And there's a traffic jam that you're then suddenly caught in. And that's exactly what happens here. Now let's see what the movie does. Cosmic rays are jamming up. So that's the cosmic ray pressure. And the cosmic rays are then basically shocked inside. They move very fast, slightly faster actually the alphine speed, seven times the alphine speed, and this cosmic ray flux drives the waves unstable. These waves couple the cosmic rays to the thermal gas and cause this pressure gradient. And this pressure gradient across this cloud accelerates this cloud, as you can see here from this moving X range. Let me play this movie again. So cosmic rays are being jammed. So they are basically up here, the pressure gradient builds up, and they basically almost don't move upstream. You can see the cosmic ray speed divided by the local alphane speed is almost zero. And this causes really this bottleneck of cosmic rays that builds up a linear, almost linear gradient along this cloud that will accelerate this cloud to high velocities. So that's the solution we get here. As a side note, you really need to account for the dynamics of the alphine waves to actually capture this effect that the cosmic rays don't move at the alphine speed, but they can actually get faster by a factor of seven. All right, you may say, oh, that's all theory. What about reality? That's a meerkat image of the galactic center. Let's look at this particular part of the map. You see this very interesting harp-like features. What is it? Well, imagine there's a massive star blowing a stellar wind that sweeps up ISM magnetic fields. The termination shock accelerates cosmic rays. They hop on these field lines and they escape from this region. Or imagine a pulsar that has its pair plasma, this magnetic field in this pulsar wind nebulae, reconnects with the swept up magnetic field from the ISM. And again, you can load these magnetic field lines with cosmic ray electrons and positrons. Big question is, how do these cosmic rays move? Do they diffuse or do they stream? It looks different. And this is the idea that, we, that Timon basically followed up. He took this harp observed by Meerkat 
in the radio. He plotted the lateral profiles of the radio mission along this one, two, three, four strings of the harp, and he tested a model. Let's start with the diffusion model. Everybody loves diffusion, but it's wrong. We can see that the spatial profile of cosmic rays does not match what we observe in the radio. What about the streaming model? Well, it does a bloody good job. You can see it's a flat top profile like what you expect from the streaming, and there's some damping that causes some diffusive part of the solution. So it's not a pure streaming model, but this model fits the data quite well. So the streaming um, propagation is something we should really do now and get rid of this very simplified diffusive picture of cosmic ray propagation. Now in the last five, part of my talk. Five, five minutes, sorry. Perfect. In the last part of the talk, I'm going to talk about a recent paper by Martin Sparry that just got accepted. It's the interaction of a cold cloud with a hot wind. First, we look at the magnetic fields. It has three models, no magnetic field, a turbulent wind magnetic field, and a uniform field. Now, the magnetic field alters the dynamics of cloud shattering as we show here. That's the model without a magnetic field. You can clearly see the Kelvin-Helmholtz instabilities shred and shatter this cloud, and you can see that there's a turbulent um, wake. A turbulent wind magnetic field changes this. The Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities are strongly suppressed. And finally, a uniform magnetic field suppresses the instability along the field, but not perpendicular. Here, the field is actually pointing into the plane, and therefore, you can also shred this cloud. What happens? Well, the magnetic draping layer that you see forming here is actually protecting this cloud against the instabilities because you form a strong magnetic field in this sheath. Let me play this again. That protects basically the cloud from being uh, getting Kevin Helmholtz unstable, at least along the magnetic field. Now, what we see here that the turbulent magnetic field extends the cloud's lifetime by about a factor of 1.3. So this means Kevin Helmholtz instabilities shatters a small cloud into small pieces that mix and dissolve into the hot wind. Magnetic field protects against instabilities, but it does not help alter the cloud's destruction. So it's a quantitative, but not a qualitative game changer. What is now changing the game is the size of the, uh, the cloud. If you increase now the cloud diameter or radius, from 150 parsecs to 1.5 parsecs, you see that the cloud mass is not decreasing as a function of time, as you see here for the small clouds, but in fact, at some critical length scale, it starts to increase. Why is this? Well, the ramp pressure strip gas from a large cloud mixes with the hot wind to intermediate temperatures. Thermal instability causes a further cooling and in fact, the net accretion of hot gas to the cold tail. This means we have a momentum transfer from the hot wind to the cool accreted material, and that implies we have now a fast outflow of a cold, warm phase. This completely transforms our understanding of galactic winds, and we are not the only ones studying on this. There's a lot of papers being written recently on this effect. Now, Martin ran many simulations, varying the density ratio between the cloud and the background from 100 to 1,000, varying the Mach numbers. In this case, is a Mach number of 1.5. Five, he looked at subsonic, supersonic clouds, and he was trying to understand what is the critical scale for transitioning from the destruction to the growing regime. And he found that this depends on the hot wind cooling time that sets this transition radius, not the mixed phase cooling time. So our cloud growth criterion is the ratio of the cooling time of the wind to the cloud brushing time has to be less than 10 times a function of Mach number cloud size wind density and the wind velocity. And that's shown here with this thick black line. Now, some people may disagree with this statement and therefore Martin looked at a trace analysis to reveal the physics of this transition radius. And he finds there are typically two regimes. There's a slow regime, where you lower the temperature from the hot wind to some temperature that is a factor of two or three below and then is a fast cooling regime, which basically plummets like a rock. 
So the rate limiting step here in the cooling process is the initial decline from 10 to the 7 to something like 10 to the 6.5 or 6.7. Now, <clears throat> this initial decline in temperature is caused by mixing or compressible fluctuations, as we show here. It's the ratio of the cooling time divided by the cloud crushing time as a function of temperature. Um, a small cloud, which is basically is being destroyed because the cooling time is longer than predicted by our criterion. A large cloud, shown here in blue, is below this critical line, and therefore it can cool faster. And you can see the scatter here is set really by mixing of the hot wind and by compressible fluctuations. Now let me conclude my talk. I've shown to you that cosmic ray transport is important in multiphase plasmas. We've been able to come up with a novel theory of cosmic ray transport mediated by alpha in waves that is coupled to MHD. I've shown to you that by looking at synchrotron harps, that streaming of cosmic rays dominates over diffusion. And finally, a cosmic ray bottleneck effect can cause the acceleration of a warm cloud. I've also shown to you that the interaction of a cold cloud with a hot wind, um, magnetic fields are important, but they don't change the game here. However, what changes the game is this growth regime, which transfers momentum from the hot wind to the cooling and accreting material, applying a fast outflow of the cold and the warm phase. If you have a small cloud here, um, it's hard to imagine how you can fund for this several kiloparsecs because it will eventually shatter and dissolve in the wind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christoph. Very cool. Um, all right. Uh, if there's, we now have 10 minutes for questions. Please feel free to, oh, there are, there are a, a number. All right. I'll start with uh, Todd. Hi, Christoph. Uh, great Hi. to see you and everybody here after, after many years. Um, I just had a, one quick question to get us started. Uh, on your one-dimensional simulations of the cloud being accelerated by the cosmic ray pressure gradient, can you talk about the role, if any, of the thermal pressure gradient, um, which was uh, shown in the, I think, the lower left panel? That's true. Um, that is actually, first of all, this cloud was in pressure equilibrium, and then we, when we had the cosmic ray um, um, flux coming in, then, of course, there were some initial perturbations once the cosmic ray flux hits the cloud, so that compressed mm -hmm. the cloud initially, and, of course, yeah, there are some fluctuations in the thermal pressure, but eventually that thermal pressure was barely changing. It was roughly constant, and only the cosmic rays was doing the work here. Now, oh, it, it definitely looked like there was a thermal pressure gradient through the cloud, unless I'm misremembering, but other people are nodding in my general zoom direction. So <laughs> I was, it looked like it was, it was the, orange, the orange lower left line. Maybe I misunderstood. I think it was labeled P-thermal, and it was increasing through the cloud. Okay, let me just go there. That's figure you're basically looking at, right? Uh, that's what I'm talking about right there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, that's, <clears throat> so, I mean, it is- Does it do any, I'm just asking if it does anything, that's it. I mean, of course it does something, but the cosmic ray pressure gradient is larger and it wins over this, basically. Okay. That, that's a short answer. There's a fine answer, but, but I mean, there's quite some dynamics there and, and we are currently in the process of further understanding these details. I mean, this glitches here, come from the details of the cooling curve, and I don't think they matter, basically. It's, it's, so that this may change if you change this, but, but overall, there's an overall pressure gradient that wins and that accelerates this cloud. Thanks. Um, let's go to uh, Paul Nielsen. Oh, hi, Christoph. Um, hi. My question is just about how you, whether you worried about the ionization of the cloud, or did you just assume that it was fully ionized in those uh, calculations? Very good question. So yes, we assumed it was fully ionized, and of course it matters a lot whether it's ionized or not, because if you have a low ionization degree and a lot of neutral material, then you get a strong ion neutral damping. And the ion neutral damping is super efficient of basically getting rid of all the waves, and this effectively causes the cosmic rays not to be coupled anymore to the background plasma. So um, I would say cosmic rays are doing, I, are great agent for doing feedback on the phase that is, I would say, a thousand Kelvin and up. Below there, if you talk about a cold or molecular phase, I don't think that cosmic rays, if, except for their ionization um, part, but in terms of sort of being coupled to the gas, they're not very efficient. 
So there I would say use supernovae, use radiation, etc., and other stuff. Well, I mean, they do some um, ionization. So, I mean, I should take this a little bit back, but in terms of coupling, they're not coupled. Thanks. Okay. Um, my uh, fellow co-host, Frank Vandenbosch, cannot raise his hand on Zoom, uh, but he does have a question. And I do have hands. <laughs> <laughs> Christoph, the same question about the same issue as uh, Todd had a question about, that uh, acceleration of the cold clouds with the cosmic ray pressure. I assume you, have, you, you assume there that the magnetic field is uniform throughout the background medium and the cold gas. Correct. If you would actually envision that the cold gas actually forms out of, a, out of the hot medium, then the magnetic field would be boosted, in which case, do you actually get the opposite effect? Does the, the enhancement of the magnetic field over... Overrun. That's a super interesting question, and I'm sure we will see lots of papers written about this topic in the future. So first of all, if the cloud has usually some angular momentum, so you can conceive this basically during the collapse to insulate itself. And if the cosmic rays don't come in, there's no, or the acceleration is less so. So that, that's one problem, basically. You have to really ensure that you connect the magnetic field from the hot to the warm or cold phase. Um, now, if you boost it, I mean, as long as there is a decrease in alpha in speed, I would say this bottleneck effect works. And Josh Wiener has worked with Alan on this, and um, uh, a few other, Zhang and O, have actually used this uh, cloud test in their code simulation paper. So I think the, the outcome is, is, is as it is, as long as the, as the alpha in speed uh, decreases if you go into the cloud. Sure, but, but if, if I make my cloud out of the background by just simple contraction and flux well, insulation, then I should get a, an enhanced magnetic field inside. So you could imagine, uh, Frank, you don't change the magnetic field if you collapse along the magnetic field. So you could think that at some point the magnetic field upholds the collapse perpendicular and you only collapse along the direction in which part it, it's mostly constant. So it's it's... I mean, there, there are certain situations that really depends on, 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 on how you set up your problem exactly. But I think as long as, you see it, as the cloud is connected and as long as the alpha speed drops inside the cloud, this is a process that will work. And that's great, basically, because you can accelerate it in principle to very high uh, velocities. Um, let's take uh, the next question from uh, Paco. And uh, I also want to particularly encourage uh, from now, like moving forward, if there are any uh, junior people in the in the audience who uh, uh, have any questions, please feel free to ask. And this is this is this is exactly the right time and venue uh, to uh, like do so. So uh, please, please do. But in, in, now we'll take a question from uh, pa, uh, pa, pa. Hey, thanks for thanks for that, uh, that comment. Um, uh, so I just Christoph had a question about um, the, the harp picture that, that you what, could you go back to that slide? Oh, yes, please. So, this one? Yeah, um, I, I think maybe I missed it. Yeah, where, I wanted to get a sense of, do you know where in the galaxy this is? Like how high above the midplane and... So that's the Sagittarius okay. A star. It's right at the center. And here you see the inner bubbles. So these are not the Fermi bubbles, but they are quite big. And we are talking about the central... I forgot about the exact dimensions, a central few hundred parsecs here. Okay, so we're, we're really far in. Okay. We're really far in, and these are strongly magnetized filaments, so you're talking about field strengths of order 200, 300 microgauss. I mean, this is really extreme here, but that's really, I think, what it, we have to understand physics here also in this multi-phase part of the galaxy, and that, that's quite extreme to what we are used to think about. Okay. Thank you. I, I, that gives me a sense of like the conditions and where where you were talking about with these harps. Yeah. Um, Xiao Shen. Oh hi. I guess I have a naive question about the cold cloud thing. Oh, um, so sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Certainly. Oh yeah. Uh, for the clouds that are being accelerated by cosmic ray, like. Does the cosmic ray heat the cloud a lot? Like in terms of energy that cosmic ray dumped in the cloud, what's a relative fraction of heating and kinetic energy? That's a good question. I think let me go back to this image. Okay. So 
the pressures here are in units of ergs per cubic centimeter. So there's a 10 to the minus 13 here. These are the Alfin wave energies. These are four orders of magnitudes down. So the heating associated with this is actually very, very small, mostly because at the interfaces, you do cool up quite a bit, you know, thermally away. Oh, so this one does have the thermal cooling, like optical yes. thermal cooling? Yes, exactly. Oh, yeah. so that's at the interfaces. This is the split, what you see here. So it's oh. not fully balanced, basically. I see. But, cool. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> you, you can certainly improve. I mean, this is basically one of the many co-tests Team one has run. And you will see on the archive this paper in a, in a week or so. So we have finished this paper now and we will sort of put it out. So please check it out and, 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 and give me your comments if you have any about, about this and other tests we basically run. <clears throat> but it works now, that's it. So cosmic rays are now in a repo, also in this sort of more elaborate model where we have, where we're solving for the energy and the flux. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, I just I just feel like the cosmic ray heating sometimes could be very strong, like the even dominates the kinetic part, but as long as it turn on cooling, it really helps <laughs> in terms of survival of the cloud. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks very much, uh, Christoph. I think, I think it's time to, uh, time to move on. That was, that was really great. Thank you.